Good morning and welcome. Hold on. Let's stand and worship together. Authentic Life, please be seated. Welcome this morning. Glad everyone made it out in our uh, pre-summer beautiful day that we have in Tucson. We don't really have winter here, if you haven't noticed. We have summer and then pre-summer or summer light, but yeah, apparently it's supposed to get 25, down to 25 this week. It's kind of crazy. I saw 
My wife was getting firewood inside the house. We don't even have a fireplace. I don't know what that's... It's going to be bad. So anyway, uh, direct your attention to the bulletin and the uh, connection card. Uh, for if you haven't been here in a while or first time, uh, please fill out your connection card and give us a little info about yourselves. We won't sell it to Amazon or anybody else. But uh, put comments on there like, you know, you need prayer or you want to meet with a pastor or uh, we have a baptism coming up. Uh, if you are interested in that and learning more about Authentic Life, any of those things, uh, or need to volunteer for something, uh, we actually do read those. Or if you just want to know who the Kansas City Chiefs are because you've never heard of them, um, <laughs> I just got a really dirty look for that one. But uh, you can put anything on the connection card. We actually do read those and put those in the uh, tithe and offering box uh, back there by the next steps table. A lot of stuff going on uh, this week. And by the way, did you guys know? uh, So I actually drove past the pastor's house this morning. There's smoke coming out of the backyard like crazy. Like he's going full Old Testament with the animal sacrifices. The... uh, (laughs) And he's normally so introverted and quiet and demure and, you know, very kind of reserved personality. But I think there's like a football game going on this afternoon or something. But, uh, yeah, he's just talking about forgiveness for Eagles fans or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, other important things going on in kids' life. They need workers in kids' life because the workers over there keep the kids during uh, church and not just keep them and keep them alive, but actually uh, teach them. Uh, things about Jesus and teach them, you know, on their age appropriate level of what we're learning in here. So incredibly important. They're in uh, need of workers, probably because my kids have run some of the workers off, which let's face it, but uh, um, def- definitely need workers over there. Uh, and it's not a full time thing. You don't have to do, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. They can schedule you once a month. There's different uh, uh, jobs, different positions based on what you might want to do from signing kids in to watching bigger kids to little kids to playing with babies and puppies and kittens, um, all those things. Whatever you whatever you can do, they have a place for you over there. So please uh, put that in your connection card or see uh, uh, Ms. Jessica about that. Uh, coming up, uh, I believe it's this Saturday, uh, the 18th, is Vail Pride Day. And if you don't know what that is, if you haven't been here long, it is a community thing with the Vail School District, you know, pride in the community. And it is an opportunity for us to get out in the community and be seen and invite people to church. And we've been doing that for a lot of years now to have a little booth there and invite people to church. And there's a ton of people walking through. A lot of them are new to uh, the area because we get a lot of uh, people coming in, moving in, moving out kind of thing. So a lot of people new to the area that may not know that we even exist, and it's a great opportunity to invite them to exist, So, or to invite them to church. So we have uh, a sign-up back there on the next step table. Please sign up. We have it in shifts. You can do one shift, two shifts, all shifts, um, sleep over the night before at Pastor Jeff's house. He said that's cool, as long as you wear a Chiefs jersey. I don't know. Um, but please sign up back at the next step table. We need people out there. Uh, we need smiley uh, faces to invite people to uh, church. So very, very important stuff. Uh, And then last but not least, on a serious note, the prayer focus has been for the Arizona Baptist Children's Services and for the Sanctity of Life Day. We've been talking about this week after week. Bring your, if you brought those baby bottles with change, uh, bring those back to the next step table. Uh, it's pretty much the last Sunday to get those back. But we're collecting those because there has been, to put it as plainly as possible, there's been an attack on life uh, in our world, in our society, in our government, in all, all sorts of places for, for many years. And that is uh, against everything that we stand for and believe in as, you know, as Christians and in the Bible. Uh, you know, God created life and created all of us in his image. And it is uh, incredibly important. Uh, and it's a great cause to help uh, support mothers, babies, uh, and give, uh, quite frankly, give babies a, a chance at life. Uh, so that's why we're supporting it. If you have a baby bottle that you filled up with spare change, it goes to a great cause to get there. Uh, keep their ministry going so they can serve women, so they can serve children in our community here locally at the Crisis Pregnancy Center and Arizona Baptist Children's Services from everything from uh, crisis pregnancy stuff to adoption to foster care to all sorts of uh, situations there. So a lot of different facets to that ministry, but a very good ministry and something that we support wholeheartedly at uh, Authentic Life Church and just as Christians uh, because it's uh, a very important ministry to God's heart as well. And with that, uh, let's pray for our uh, service this morning. God, we just love you and we come before you and we thank you for this time together to uh, meet and serve you and uh, and worship in your name. We thank you for the uh, New Life Pregnancy Centers and the Arizona uh, Baptist Christian Children's Services that uh, all that they do for children. You know that uh, you you tell the little children to come to you. You've you've ordained children. You've made them in your image and they are incredibly important to you. Every life is incredibly important to you. 
and you love those lives, even the ones that haven't come to know you yet. You love us all uh, because you created us, and we just thank you for uh, the sanctity of life. We thank you for giving us life, and we just uh, recognize that uh, all those gifts, uh, especially those, uh, come only from you. We thank you for this time today and just uh, praise you and worship you and point our hearts and words towards you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and continue to worship our Lord this morning.
Isaiah 64, um, in verses, starting in verse 6, it says, All of us have become like something unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. No one calls on your name, striving to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of our iniquity. Yet, Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and we are all the works of your hands. So whatever whatever is broken in us, whatever is not right in us, we can take that and we can give that to God, and he will make us whole because of his amazing grace. Amazing. Lord, uh, we are thankful to you for everything you've done for us, that you do take our brokenness and you make that new, Lord. I pray for Pastor Jeff as he comes up here that he would uh, bring your word forward with uh, honesty and certainty and that th- that word would touch our hearts, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Man, you be seated. Good morning. All right. Thank you to our worship team for leading us today. Church, a proper response to who God is. One of our responses is to sing to him and to sing of him. So I'm grateful for you guys. I'm also grateful for all those who are serving uh, today, whether you're teaching or serving in kids' life or on our welcome team. Thanks for being a church uh, that serves the Lord. I want to challenge our church, though. Um, You know, our kids are valuable to the Lord, and so they are valuable to us. And I just want to, this is just a pastoral message here real quick. Uh, We put a plea out for a few weeks for people just to even ask about kids' life. Um, And we've not gotten any response. I'm going to challenge us in this moment right now to, to ask the Lord if, if the Lord wants you to serve in one way or another in kids' lives. So we're going to pause and we're going to pray about that. Does that sound okay? Right? We, we need to do that. We got plenty. They're all good. Everything's good over there. But church, we got people in here that can serve in kids' life and uh, we need to pray about that. So let's do that. Father, we just pause in this moment and we lift up our kids' life workers to you. And God, we are so grateful for them, the work they put into uh, studying and preparing throughout the week. Uh, God, we're, we're grateful that we see kiddos coming uh, to Christ. Uh, we love that, God, and, and we love that we get to be a part of it. But God, we are seeking you right now to stir in the hearts um, of those 
those in our church that, that need to be serving in kids' life, whether it's once a month or twice a month. But God, we pray, Lord, that whoever it is that you're asking to serve, that you would stir in their heart and they would respond to that. And God, we just pray, Lord, that they would have an amazing day over there today, um, that they would uh, learn more and more about Jesus. And if there's a child over there that does not know Jesus, that you would draw them near to you and save them today. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right? If we ask, we don't get it, we go to God. Amen? Actually, we should go to God first, all right? Hey, man. So, um, man, we are, we started a, a new series last week in the book of Acts titled Acts to the Ends of the Earth. And we saw last week who we are as a church, right? We saw that the church is ordinary people saved by an extraordinary God and his extraordinary, er, extraordinary grace filled with the Holy Spirit. And we are called to be Jesus' witnesses to the world around us. We also saw the example of the early church that they were united together, right? They were united together. That's why I had to wear this shirt instead of this one, right? So there's no disunity issues. Amen. So, but they were united together, church, uh, as a family, and they were desperate for God to move. They were desperate for God to move. Knowing that on our own, church, we are not able to be who he calls us to be. We're not able to accomplish uh, what he calls us to accomplish on our own. And so knowing that, we're to be a church that continues to seek God in prayer, desperate for him to do things in and through us. This morning, we continue in our study in Acts. So open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. It's in the uh, second part of your Bible, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Uh, we'll be in verses 42 through 47 today. Uh, while you're turning there, let me remind you what happened leading up to our, our section of Scripture so that we're in the right context and understand what's going on. Uh, Luke is Dr. Luke, right? He was not only a, a, a Christian man, but he was also a, a physician. Uh, but he wrote Luke, and then God used him to write the book of Acts and he tells us in the book of Acts, this is Jesus has already died on the cross. He has already risen on the third day. He has now spent a bunch of, or about 40 days with his followers, with his disciples. And then Jesus is about to ascend to be with the Father in heaven. But before he does, he gathers his disciples together. He follows uh, his followers as well. And he tells them, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. If you are saved, if you trust in Jesus, that's the promise for us, church, right? The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. And he's telling them the Holy Spirit is going to empower you from within. And Jesus says, I'm going to send you out. This commission is for us too, church. He says, I'm going to send you out to tell others about me, to tell them who I am, what I did, and invite them to follow me. And after that happened, Jesus ascends into, a heaven, into heaven, and then about 120 followers of Jesus I think, I think we got to pause and, and be reminded of this. Remember, Jesus is, at certain points, he's preaching. And the Bible says there's 5,000 men there. There's probably fifteen to 20,000 total with women and children there. we got a big moment like that. Thousands of people, hundreds of people, and now you have 120 following Jesus. They gather in an upper room, but they are united. No distractions, no divisions. And they prayed desperately for God. I think they prayed for him to help them, to use them, and to lead them. And then soon after that, Paul, the, the Holy Spirit comes, excuse me, Peter, Paul's not in the story yet, but Peter goes and stands before thousands of people to preach. And he's preaching to many of the same people who had just rejected Jesus. He's preaching to many of the same people who had cried out for Jesus to be crucified. But God is using Peter to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with them. He tells them, this Jesus whom you crucified, he's the promised one. He's the one you've been waiting for. He is the Messiah, the Christ. He is the Savior. He is Lord. And after hearing this, God convicts their hearts. And, and Peter tells them to repent, to turn from you being in charge, turn from your sins, and turn to Jesus. And then in verse 41, it says this, So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. They heard the good news of Jesus. They heard that this is a good word, church. I think they heard that it wasn't too late for them. They came to hear, and Jesus, God convicted their heart, and they heard that Jesus came to die for them, to rescue them, to save them from their sins, to bring them into the family. And so they believed what they heard. They believed in the gospel of Jesus, and they turned to Jesus and they followed that up with being baptized. We need to understand baptism is not salvation. Baptism is a profession of our faith in Christ Jesus. 
right? It is obedient. We got to be obedient church. We got to follow that up with, with baptism, but it's a step after we are saved. And that's what happens. They believe. And then 3000 souls were baptized. 3000 souls were added. 3000 souls were now adopted into the family of God and they became part of his church. And today we're going to look at a text where we see what made them a healthy church. We could, right, we need to see a healthy model, church, amen? Are you with me? We need to see a healthy model. In our passage today, especially in our first verse, verse 42, it's a passage that we should become familiar with if we aren't already. I think it's a passage that we as a church should really memorize and know. This passage shows us what this church, what this group of believers were all about it shows us that what they were devoted to and what made them healthy. We're going to see a church family that is fully devoted and that's healthy. The Bible tells us that the church is a body, right? The church is called the body of Christ. It's the body of believers. Jesus is the head, right? And then we are part of the, the body. Romans chapter 12 says that we are many different members, right? All with different backgrounds, all with different stories, all from people all over the world, right? But we are coming together as, as one, as one. So let's see what it looks like for our church family, this church body right here at Authentic Life to be, to be healthy and be devoted. Would you guys stand with me so we can honor God and his word? You guys follow along with me as I read from Acts chapter two, verse 42 through 47. Here's what God's word says. It says, they... Who's they? That's the church. That's the 3,120 plus or minus Christians in this new church. So they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed, all those who were saved were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Father God, we just stop and we ask you to teach us today. Help us see from this example in Acts chapter 2, a healthy church. Help us know... um, what you want from us today, help us be responsive to that. God, we know that we are all individuals that make up this one body. And so speak to us individually and corporately. God, we love you. We give us our, give you our time today in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. Each year, many of us go to an annual doctor visit. Those are fun, aren't they? Right. And we just love to hear like, Hey, I have a healthy report for you. Right. I don't think anybody wants to hear anything but that, right? Like, hey, you're healthy or you're, you're doing well. They run their tests. They ask us questions. They make observations and they give us an evaluation of whether we're healthy or not. And I know when I go to the doctor, they usually end with a statement like this. Hey, Jeff, remember, keep eating well, right? Be intentional about your diet. Keep exercising. Keep being active. And they give us recommendations of activities for us to be devoted to. Not just once a year, right, before we go to the doctor. Anybody else, before they get blood drawn, just drinks a whole bunch of water so they know you're not dehydrated, right? The rest of the year, you don't drink much water, right? Or you're not active, but you can say, hey, all last week, I worked out, doc, right? But so we can, they say, be devoted to these things in our everyday life so that we can remain healthy. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 42, we see the word devoted. It's actually the whole phrase of being continually devoted to something, to some activity, and so the picture that we see here is a, is a picture of a church who is, who is continually healthy because of their continual devotion to certain things, certain activities. We said last week that the church is made up of ordinary people who have been saved by God's extraordinary grace. Here's the thing. When people are involved, messiness is involved. Come on, right? right? Are you with me, right? And we have the ability to make a mess of things or to do things our own way or to get distracted or to stop being healthy. So verse 42 is a pretty important verse for us to know as a church. It's a great verse for us to remember as we see that we should be devoted to certain things. It's always good to see that healthy model. And the phrase that we see here is this. It says, and they, the church... 120 plus, and now 3,000 plus or minus, 
It says that they were continually devoting themselves to something. To be continually devoted, two words for us, it's just one Greek word that means to be constant in something, to continue in it. I actually love this definition. It means to be diligent and persevere in it, to be devoted to it. Here's why I like the words diligent and persevere, because sometimes it's hard to be devoted to things. Sometimes culture makes it hard. Sometimes our jobs make it hard. Sometimes life makes it hard. And so we need to be diligent and persevere in being devoted to these things. And so when we look at this, at these verses, we're going to see the example from this early church of what we should be devoted to so that we can remain healthy. Amen, church? You with me? All right. If we were to look into a mirror as a church and evaluate ourselves, what would we say? Are we healthy or not healthy? If others were to come in and evaluate Authentic Life Church and see our lives, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week, our prayer, our hope is that they would see a healthy church family. Not perfect, but healthy. A family who is continually devoting these to these activities. And so the first one is this. In a healthy church, there should be, there must be a devotion to God's word. There must be a devotion to God's word. Look at what it says in verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And we really know what the apostles were teaching, right? They were teaching about Jesus. They were teaching about Christ. They were teaching that Jesus was the Savior, that he was crucified, that he was sinless, right? That he was God, that he was sinless, and then was crucified, buried, and resurrected for us. They were teaching who he was, what he had done, and also that he was the Lord God. They were also teaching all that Jesus himself had taught them and showed them and exampled for them. How do we know that? Look at Matthew 28, 19. Jesus says, go and go therefore as you do life, as you are going, go and make disciples. Go and tell others about Jesus. Call them to follow Jesus with you. Do that of all nations and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And listen to what Jesus says next. What are we to do? Teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus had taught them to obey God and his word. He had taught them how to love and how to serve and how to live and how to care. Are you with me, church? That's what he he taught them. He taught them the truth of God's word. And so it's safe for us to, to know and believe that the apostles were teaching from Scripture. They were teaching what they learned from Jesus. They were teaching his truth. They were teaching the eternal life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They were teaching faithfully all of Scripture, not just what they liked or what made them feel better or what was culturally appropriate. They taught all of Scripture and all that Jesus had taught them. And it wasn't just the teaching of it that they were devoted to. It wasn't just the apostles who were devoted to the teaching of God's Word, but it says that the church was continually devoted. A few weeks ago in our Goodness of God series, we saw in 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter is writing to us, he's writing to Christians, and he says, hey Christians, be like newborn infants, right? Newborn infants, they crave the milk, right? The pure milk from their mother, right? And it's like like un, un, unadulterated uh, word, right? It's just, or the, the, the milk, is, I can't even think of the word. I'm struggling here, church. It's not tampered with. It's not, there we go, contaminated, right? It's not contaminated by the world, straight from the mom into the baby. Crave that. Crave the word of God like a baby craves the milk. So that by you may grow into your salvation. Words are hard this morning, church. That's what we're seeing here. There was a desire. There was a devotion to faithfully preach and teach the word. There was also a desire and devotion to be fed by the word. There was a desire to live it out. In a healthy church, we must have, this is non-negotiable church, we must have in our preaching, in our teaching, in our men's ministry, in our women's ministry, in our life groups, in our kids' ministry, in all areas of who we are as a church, there's got to be a devotion to the teaching, the growing, and the applying of God's word in all areas of our church. Our, our kids' department, our kids' kids' life is not just a babysitting thing so we can go and have a few minutes over here. They're hearing the Word of God, church. That's where we say amen because we're in agreement with that, right? They're hearing the Word of God. Our desire for His Word will lead us to, be, to have a proper devotion to it. 
At Authentic Life, our aim is to faithfully teach the Word of God. Here's my commitment, church. It doesn't matter the the year, the changes in culture, political correctness. It doesn't matter what's popular. God's Word is always true, and it will always be applicable to our lives, and so we always preach and live according to it. Psalm 119, 160 tells us why we can trust the Word of God. It says, the entirety of your word is truth. And then looking back at the verse from Peter, right? When we hunger for the word of God, it's by the word of God that we grow. Here's what that means. You and I cannot grow in our walk with Jesus unless we're in the word of God. So if you're struggling and saying, God, I'm not hearing from you, I'm not growing. Your first question is, is are you in the word? And so our job, church, isn't to pick and choose what we teach and follow. It's dangerous to do that. We can't pick and choose what we believe and, and, and don't believe. We can't like d- pick what we want to keep and discard, discard or ignore other parts of Scripture. That's dangerous, church. Second Timothy teaches us that all of God's Word is God-breathed. So we need to hear from him. We need to be fed by him. Let it be true of our church as a whole. Let it be true of you and me as individuals that we are craving and devoting the teaching, the growing, and the applying of God's word. Again, at Authentic Life Church, this is a non-negotiable for us to be healthy, for us to have a proper diet. The second activity that this church was devoted to in order to remain healthy was fellowship. Verse 42 says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. In the church, we've downplayed this a little bit to just hanging out and having a potluck. But the word fellowship carries the meaning of sharing and partnership with one another. Fellowship is one of those one another words in Scripture. It's a relational word. They knew that in order for them to be healthy as a church, they needed to have a continual devotion to one another. There needs to be a continual devotion to one another at Authentic Life. I think too often in many of our churches today, there's a devotion to the idea of me. Or devotion to the one on stage singing or preaching. Or devotion to a certain preference or style. We don't see that in the word church. Right? There needs to be the the devotion of being together and following the Lord together and being devoted to one another in unity. Churches too often today divide or walk away over secondary issues. There are reasons, church, if you've got a church that's no longer preaching the word of God, why would you be there? But too many churches, that's not the issue. It's secondary issues. And I, I've, I've experienced that firsthand. I went and pastored my first pastor at a, at a church that was arguing over lights and curtains. What? Are you with me, church? We have lost our devotion to one another when that happens. Being a part of Jesus' church is about him leading and us being united under him as his family and bringing our differences together to advance the gospel, not to divide. There's a quote that's been said by many different people, so I can't give proper credit, but it's so true. It says this. I think it's up here. The church is not a building that you enter. It's not an, an event that we attend. The church is a family to which we belong. And for a family to be healthy, there needs to be intentionality. There needs to be a continual pursuit of unity and partnership with one another. When we think about partnership, it reminds me of what we looked at last week in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. The church had just heard from Jesus this huge mission. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and then you need to get to work. You need to go be my witnesses. You need to tell other people about me and who I am and what I did right here and then Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They received this huge mission from Jesus, and they all gathered together in one accord with one mind in unity, partnering together to do what God called them to do. When it comes to accomplishing the mission of Jesus, we need one another. We need partnership, church. We've got to have partnership. 
right? We can't reach, if only this section is, is trying to share the gospel, we can't reach all of Tucson, right? You guys work in places that others won't ever work. You guys are around people that none of us will ever be around. So there's this partnership. We work together. Again, we need partnership. We need to not forsake gathering together. In fact, church, that's a biblical command. It's not just something that we like to say at Authentic Life. It's a biblical command that we're not to forsake the assembly of being together. We need one another. We need a united partnership continually. And to see more about being one another in this partnership idea, look with me to verse 44. This shows us how fellowship is lived out practically. Fellowship was needed to accomplish God's mission It's needed to help us grow in our walk with Jesus, but it's practical. Look at verse 44. And all of those who had believed, that's the church. If you are saved, he's talking about those that came before us, right? All those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So I want to pause here just for a second, because I want to say this is not socialism being lived out. This is 100% generosity within the body of Christ being lived out. That's what this is. This is Christians coming together, all of them, Right? All of them coming together, married people, single people, families with with kids and without kids, older and younger, rich and poor, coming together, doing life together, and they took care of one another. If there was a true need within the, the, the church, right? We're not talking about someone that's lazy and trying to live off of that. If there was a true need in the church, the church was generous, right, with what they had with one another. And so fellowship is a partnership and it's generosity. And then fellowship involves constant interaction with one another. The church is not just something that a group of like-minded people attend once a week or twice a week. That's never God's design for the church. If we only have a relationship with people within here, I'm not saying you got to know everybody, right? But if you don't have a relationship with people right inside this church, outside of the church, are you with me? Right? If we don't have that, we're, we're missing out. They had a constant interaction. It was a family. It's the body of Christ. And so there's this intentionality of gathering and doing life and having fun and sharing a meal and praying and encouraging one another. Look at verse 46. It says, day by day, right? Continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. The example we have from this early church is they had constant interaction. You know, you know what we pursue here? Real relationships. You cannot have a real relationship with others in the church if you don't have a, a constant interaction with them. It's not possible. They enjoyed one another. It was a sincere, sincere relationship. I like the way one commentator put it. I want us to, to, to see this first sentence right here. Half the job of a good church member is showing up. You can't build relationships if you aren't meeting with God's people. And then we see that part of their fellowship was that they gathered together in both large and small groups. Verse 44 or 46 told us that they met in the temple and in homes. For them, there was the large gathering of 3,000 plus or minus people, but then they were also going from home to home, right? There, I'm going I'm to tell you, church, there is nothing like it when God's people all gather together to worship him. And to open his Bible together and pray and serve together. This is the large weekly family reunion and celebration. By the way, I don't know if you guys are paying attention, but there is a, I'm going blank on the name. There is a college right now that is blowing up. They're having a revival like like we haven't seen in our country in years. They started on the 9th of this month. What's today? The 12th. And they haven't left yet. They're still there worshiping and teaching and, and praying gathering in large groups. There's nothing like it, church. But there's also the need to do it on a smaller level in smaller groups. Why? Because we need to be seen and heard and cared for and loved. And that is just not possible on a large group scale. It's hard to be known in a large group. And so they gathered together in less formal, more personal gatherings. The early church didn't have just one. They had both. And so we see that they were devoted to the word. 
They were continually devoted to one another. And then verse 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of of bread. I believe this is them talking about the Lord's Supper, taking the Lord's Supper together. In church, when we take the Lord's Supper together, what are we doing? We're remembering Jesus. We're remembering his life. We're remembering that he is that he willingly came and gave himself for us. We're focusing on the amazing reality that Jesus, our King and Lord and Savior, intentionally went to the cross where he suffered and bled and died for you and me. Jesus did that, right? And so, so that we could be forgiven and saved from our sins and so that we could have a personal relationship with him. When we take the Lord's Supper together, here in a few minutes, we're going to do this together. You know what it is? It's to direct our minds to Jesus, Part of being a healthy church is to have a continual devotion to being Christ-centered. I think this is a big problem in our churches today. We want to, we've got to keep guard of our hearts that we're not like Jeff-centered or you-centered, but Christ-centered. Jesus writes to the church in Revelations, and he tells the church of Ephesus, he says, Church, you're doing so many things well. You're doing this, and you're doing this, and you're doing this, and you're doing this. If anybody else was to look at that, they would say, way to go, church. But he tells them, you're missing the most important thing. You forgot your first love. You forgot Jesus. Our time together shouldn't be me or you centered, but Jesus centered. And when we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded who he is, what he did, and that he is worthy of our complete surrender. Taking the Lord's Supper is part of us worshiping him. I think the devotion to this by the early church showed the Christ-centered nature of their church. Jesus was their first love. He was the recipient of their singing and of their worship. He was why they served. He was why they sang. He was why they gave. He was why they sacrificed. He was why they gathered. He is why they lived. And so when we say at Authentic Life that today we say this all the time, we're here to make much of Jesus. Our aim is to glorify him to keep our eyes on him, to make all that we do today about him. If we want to be healthy, we've got to be Christ-centered. There's no plan B, church. All right. Next, Luke writes in Acts 2.42, they were devoted to, to the, uh, continually devoted to the teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We talked about this a bit last week, but for us to be the church God calls us to be, for us to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish, for us to be on mission for him, for you and I together to live in the way he calls us to live, we must have a devotion to prayer. Remember back in Acts one fourteen, Jesus gathers, or he gives these 120 people this mission. It says they went back to Jerusalem. They gathered in the upper room. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to what, church? To prayer. Let's try that again, okay? They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. prayer. As we walk through Acts, we're going to see this over and over again. Acts is an exciting book. We see a lot of things happen, but I think we can miss their continual devotion to prayer. They prayed and God moved. They prayed and God acted. They prayed and God answered. They prayed and God shook the place. They prayed and God did things in and through them that they could never do on their own. Church, we need to pause for a second and remember that we have access to the creator and savior and Lord. The one that put the stars up in the sky, right? The one that sustains all things, right? We get complete access to him and so we should be devoted to praying to him. And to see the ultimate example, we look back to Luke or the other gospels in the life of Jesus. Jesus himself was consistently spending time with the Father in prayer. Before he began his earthly ministry, he prayed. Before he chose his apostles, he prayed. Before and after he spoke and preached, he prayed. Before he went to the cross, what did he do, church? He prayed. As Christians, this is to be a way of life for us. Not something we do, but who we are. As a church, right, it's got to be who we are. Prayer was never meant to just be a Hail Mary. How often do we wait? We do things on our own, and then we ask Facebook for help, and then we reach out to social services. I'm not saying any of that. Are you with me, church? Like we, It's like the very last thing. God, I've got nothing else. I've tried everything else, and so I'm going to give you a shot. That's what we do. We throw up our Hail Mary. Never, never intended to be that way. Prayer should be in our DNA. Prayer should be like us taking a breath. 
It should be our go-to. It should be what we do before, during, and after, whatever it is. The church, this church here, they believe Jesus. They believe Jesus when he told them, church, apart from me, you can do nothing. The church also understood something, that they were fully dependent on God. For us to be healthy, we must believe and understand that we were created to be prayerfully dependent on God. Prayerfully dependent. That's going to be a theme for us this year and in this study, that we are dependent on Him. And so we must seek Him in prayer continually. And by the way, let me throw this out there. For a few years now, we have a church, as a church, have set aside the time 1.11 p.m. to pray. Just a dedicated time every single day to pray for what God is doing in and through Authentic Life Church. Why 111? We launched on January 11th, 2015. It's the only reason. If 111 doesn't work for you, pick a different time. But church, if we look at our phone, we look at our calendars, we look at our reminders, we've got reminders in there of things we're devoted to is prayer in there. If it's not, I would encourage you to do that to pray daily because one eleven or whatever time is going to come and go and we're going to forget because life is busy. Be devoted to it. Set aside one eleven to pray for Authentic Life Church. I don't know if this is a word or not, but I would like to re-encourage you to do that. Next month, we're going to be starting a monthly day of praying together. I, I, I can't stress how important this is. There are, I'm just, I'm just going to lay this out there. There are going to be people that said, man, I'm here for church and then I'm going to head out. I'm just encourage you, let's not do that. We're going we're gonna to let you know. Uh, if you haven't filled out the survey, by the way, we sent out a survey. If you haven't filled that out, um, there's three options on there to pray after church, to pray on a day of the week. Um, and uh, next week we'll, we'll set the date and say this is when we're going to pray. Um, but that's what we got to do, church. Just small steps to help us be, help prayer be a, a part of our DNA. These are just reminders that, that, that we aren't just a church that prays, but we are a praying church, a church that's devoted to prayer. For the last one, I want us to look at a few different verses. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth or to the ends of the earth. Jesus is sending you and me out to tell others who he is, what he did, and how to follow, teach them how to follow Jesus. This is the gospel church. This is the good news. That, that's what the gospel is. Let's think about this. Like The gospel was never like originally, it was never originally a, a, a Bible word. The word gospel was, was used in their culture. Back in their day, you would have an emperor or a king, and he would have a person that would herald or proclaim good news. I don't know what it looked like, but I imagine it was something like Paul Revere, you know, like riding, riding his horse and going and proclaiming this truth, right? He's procla- well, that, that wasn't good news, but, you know. Okay, I, bad, bad example. Okay, but you get the idea. Like the king and the emperor would send, quit it. The, the, the king or the emperor would send somebody out and say, here's some good news. We've won the war, right? Some kings would send them out true story and say, I've got a gospel for you. I'm raising your taxes, right? That was good news to the king. Jesus is sending you out and me out to share the good news with the world. We're to herald and proclaim to all the land the gospel. And with Jesus, with him coming to rescue us, to save us, to forgive us, to to make us new, to, to give us a home in heaven with him for eternity, this isn't just good news, church. This is the best news ever. This is the best news ever. We're gonna I'm gonna step on every single one of our toes, including mine. We are so good about posting and talking and sharing about our sports team or our political party or our favorite car or our hobbies or whatever it may be. And praise God for all of those things. They help us enjoy life. But the best news that you've ever received and the best news you could ever share with anybody is the gospel of Jesus. And Jesus is sending you and me out to tell others to advance the gospel. Church, we need to know that God is sovereign. He is in control. You know what else he's in control of? He's in control of you and me. He has placed you in your life where you are on purpose, right? We say this all the time. You work where you work. You live where you live. You play where you play because that's where God has placed you because there are people around you that you may be the only one that ever shares the gospel with them. 
We have the privilege to tell others who Jesus is, what he did, and his love for them. Jesus never intended for you and me to sit on the sidelines. He's calling you and and me and sending us out. He's using our church to preach and share the gospel. There are people again in your life that none of us will ever sit next to or have a conversation with. Only you're going to have that. It's important that we know we get to be a part of God's mission. So look at the early church. They were devoted to God's word. They were devoted to one another. They were devoted to being Christ-centered and devoted to prayer. And then the Bible says that they were in awe of what God was doing. Let's never stop being in awe of what God was doing. And then he was using the apostles, and they were loving one another, and they were being generous. And then look how Luke wraps up chapter 2. It says, And they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Hear this, church. Their devotion to his word pointed the world to Jesus. Their devotion to one another, their love for one another, pointed people to Jesus. By the way, the world in Tucson is watching how we love one another. Their devotion to Jesus obviously pointed the world to Jesus. Their devotion to praying to God, right, pointed the world to Jesus. And they got to witness Jesus saving more and more people. The Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Authentic Life Church, we must have a devotion to advance the gospel of Jesus. In our homes, men, are you sharing the gospel? Are you being an example? Ladies, are you in your home sharing the gospel and being an example and pointing your kids, your family to Jesus? In your community, do your neighbors know that you belong to Jesus? In our city and state, and, right, we get to be a part of what God's doing all over the world through giving, through missions, and through prayer. And so I have this in your notes. We get to be a part of this both compassionately and boldly. We share the gospel because we love people. Compassion is a gut-wrenching love that requires action, right? We care about them. We care about their eternity. And so, so we can share the gospel because of our compassion, and we can share the gospel because God will give us the boldness to do so. We're going to see that in a few weeks in Acts chapter 4. But this, Authentic Life Church, is an amazing example of what a healthy church looks like. And so just as the doctor says, hey, if you want to be healthy, Stay focused, be devoted to your diet, be devoted to exercise or whatever else you need to do. Dr. Luke, God is using Dr. Luke right here to say authentic life church to be healthy, be devoted to these things. Be intentional, be focused continually. Let's pray. Father, we pause today and we thank you for the example that we have of this early church. And God, if 3,120 plus or minus people can do that, we can do it. Help us be devoted to the word, to one another, to Jesus, to prayer, and to being a part of advancing the gospel. Help us be devoted to that. Help us go home today and look at our own lives in a mirror and say, am I, I'm a part of the church, am I devoted to these things? God, help us faithfully preach and teach and live out and apply the word of God. God, I pray, Lord, for someone Anybody here today, God, if someone says, you know what, my my first part is I I need to be devoted to Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I don't have a personal relationship with him. I know of him. I've read of him. I've studied him. I've heard of him preached. I've read him in the Bible, but I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. He's not saved me from my sins. He's not the boss of my life. He's not the Lord of my life. God, if there's someone here today that says, I need Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you would convict them of that. We see in Acts chapter 2 that you pierce their hearts convicted them and say, I need to turn from me being in charge to the one that's actually in charge. I need to turn to Jesus and believe in who he is and what he did. So God, I pray, Lord, that you would add to our numbers those who are being saved. God, I pray, Lord, for you to convict our hearts as the church, that we would continually look back and say, God, I need to be devoted to these things. So God, teach us here in these moments. In Jesus' name, with your eyes closed, church, just have that moment with God. God, what are you teaching me? What's my role? What do I need to do? And if you're here today and you say, you know what? I know a lot about Jesus, or maybe it's the first time you're hearing him, of him. But he's not my Lord. He's not rescued me. I'm not adopted into his family. I'm not saved. If that's you today, you say, today's the day. I need to to give my life to Jesus. If that's you today, I would love for you to slip your hand up. I'm not going to call you out, talk to you after church. But you got to respond. 
Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, he said, who do others say that I am, but who do you say that I am? Because your answer to that question will determine your eternity. Do you know Jesus? Father, as we go into this time of a little more worship and Lord's Supper, I pray, Lord, that that we'd be Christ-centered in all this. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus gathered in Luke chapter 22. He's got his disciples with him. He's having a private moment with them. He's being betrayed as he says these things. And it says, as Jesus took bread, he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, take this, eat this bread in remembrance of me. Remember who I am and what I did. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus gave his life. He sacrificed his life for for you and me. And so we're going to take the Lord's Supper. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that that we're to take this in a, in a worthy manner. We're to examine our hearts. I love referring back to um, what David says in Psalm 139, God, search me and try me, know my heart, find if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Church, this is a great time. When we take the Lord's Supper, this is a great time to take your sins to God. As you remember that he died on the cross for those sins. It's a good time to take any relationships that you have that aren't God honoring, if there needs to be forgiveness, we've been forgiven, so how can we not forgive others? And it's just a great time to remember and give God praise for what he did. And so God, guys, we're going to take the Lord's Supper here, and um, I'm going to invite you. You don't have to be a member of the church. You just need to be saved. If you're saved, if, if Jesus is Lord of your life, you can come up and grab one of the elements, take it back to your seat, spend your time uh, with the Lord, examine your heart, give God thanks. Take your sin to him, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. And so when you're ready, go ahead and and come and grab, and then we're going to take them together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he Christ is risen, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, church. Bible says, and Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. So let's give Jesus thanks. Father, we stop and we say thank you. 
we can't ever say thank you enough, but God, we are so grateful for what you did for us when we deserved nothing. You loved us in a way that we could never uh, return um, th- th- that love. God, you, you, you forgave us for sins that we never deserved to be forgiven of, and you adopted us into a family even when we chose before to reject you. And so, God, we pray, Lord, we give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Be glorified as we take this. Help us be Christ-centered in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to take the lid off the juice, or the, the bread first, I'm sorry. He took bread and he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this, so take this in remembrance of Jesus. Let's take it together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup in his new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. So we're going to take this in remembrance of Jesus. We know that after they took the Lord's Supper together for the first time, they worshiped. And so we're going to close out with Worship Church. Let's go ahead and stand. Were creation suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing His eminence His name would burst from sea and sky From rivers to the mountaintops We'd hear Christ be magnified Let's lift him up here, church Oh, Christ be magnified in most melody and every human heart its native cry oh then in one enraptured hymn of praise we'll sing Christ be magnified oh Christ be magnified let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me Stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just the doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My soul
song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. Amen. Hey, church, you can be seated. couple reminders. Uh, don't forget to sign up uh, back on that back table. Church, this is for extroverts and introverts and anybody in between, right? If you're not comfortable with talking with people, we've got a curtain you can hide behind and give the kids are going fishing and you can give them candy and stickers or whatever they're going to get. So there's a place for everybody. All right. But we need to represent Jesus well as we represent our church well. And so uh, there's, uh, we've had a handful of people sign up, so I thank you for that, and uh, let's continue to do that. So sign up in the back. If you want to uh, hear more about Kids Life, maybe that's your first step. I just want to hear more about what's needed in Kids Life. Fill out your um, connection card and get that in the box back there in the tithe and offering box, and then we'll contact you and let you know more about that. Um, also, your tithes and offerings are back there, so we'll pray over that here in just one second. The last announcement that we have is uh, we've been praying about this for some time, uh, and this person has actually shown, already shown themselves to be involved. But I'm going to have Tina come up, um, and, and Adam can come up with her just so she's not by herself, because you know. But Tina... Uh, has been praying about seeking the Lord, visiting with her husband, with her family. Uh, and Tina is going to be our official women's ministry leader. And so super grateful for that. I'm grateful for her heart. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, it's amazing when we look at leaders, we look at what I call the five different C's. Do they have godly character, right? Do they have chemistry, right? Is, is God calling them, right? Are they coachable? And then, um, and then what's the last one? I'm missing one competent. Can they do it? You know, can they do it? She's already doing it, church. She's got a heart for the ladies of our church, and um, and she's going to be praying for you guys. She's got a heart for you ladies to grow in the Word, and so I'm super excited about that. So we're going to pray over her uh, before we head out, and then um, and then we'll, we'll head out. But I think... Um, did we go over that announcement? Oh, we didn't put it in the bulletin yet, but uh, keep, keep a lookout for that. We're going to have um, a, a Bible study for only ladies. Right. Okay. Sorry, Fernando. Right. So, so we're going to have a, a ladies Bible study. And, uh, so we'll, we'll do that. So be look, on the lookout for that. Is there an age limit for that? Uh, probably teens and up. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So let's pray. We're going to pray for our uh, offering. We're going to pray for Tina and, uh, and then go from there. Father, we love you. And God, we're so grateful uh, for people that you've gifted um, to, to lead or facilitate or organize, whatever it may be. But God, we are grateful for Tina and her family and God, just how they jump in and, and serve. They do it because they love you and they love the church. They love authentic life. And I know Tina loves the ladies of this church. And so, God, we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen her, empower her. God, um, that the Holy Spirit would just give her everything that she needs to, uh, to lead uh, the ladies in this. Uh, God, help her husband be uh, super supportive and encouraging uh, to her as well in this. Because we know that, God, you bring a husband and wife together to be one. And so uh, we pray, Lord, that, uh, that they would be one in this. But he would, he would encourage her and, and help her in that. Um, God, we pray, Lord, um, that our ladies' ministry would grow and that the ladies in our church would continue to grow in the relationship with one another and, most importantly, with you. And so, God, we pray, Lord, for our tithes and offerings. God, we pray, Lord, as we give, um, God, that you would be glorified in that and that it would be used to advance the gospel, to meet the needs um, of, our, of our church and our community. And uh, so, God, we pray, Lord, for you to bless that as well. And, God, we also pray for our event this Saturday at Vail Pride Day. God, help us represent you well and represent authentic life well. In Jesus' name, amen.